No 37º Block Talks, a gente conversa com Brandon Lee, fundador da Elas Digital, que conta pra gente sobre os princípios e as oportunidades com o BSV, o Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, em Build the Future. Essa entrevista está em inglês. Eu sou Maurício Magaldi e esse é o Block Drops, o primeiro podcast em português sobre blockchain para negócios. These news are not a form of endorsement, sponsorship or encouragement for consumption and are meant for educational purposes only. All right, everybody, I'm here with Brandon Lee, founder of Alice, and he will tell us who he is and what he does with blockchain. Brandon, great to have you here on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mauricio. Uh, yeah, so um, I've been working on or in Bitcoin in the space since um, really the end of 2017. So uh, in some respects, I, maybe that makes me a little bit late to the party. I don't really care. Like, I just want to get on with, with business. Um, but since, since kind of getting into it, you know, it was, it was, I felt it was very interesting when I, when I first got into Bitcoin. It was after there'd already been the, the split with Bitcoin Cash and, 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 and BTC. And um, at the time, the, the previous work, so my previous work was all about um, engineering. So I used to do control systems for big kind of, Like, like widely distributed um, distributed control systems and things like that. Um, I, I worked for two years in the lithium ion battery uh, industry, trying to develop battery packs for vehicles, uh, like micro vehicles and things in Asia. And it was at the, when that was sort of that, that business that I was involved with had sort of was winding down. Um, I had a, quite a bit of free time on my hands and um, just really, use that time to take a very you know the deepest dive that i could into what was going on and i kind of realized that this this quite small society that had been created was in the process of ripping itself apart and there was this huge war about about how do we how do we bring this thing to the world and um i mean as an engineer and and as someone who like i i sort of I don't want to call myself a futurist, but I always like to look at, at where things are going and especially in terms of technology, the way things scale. And I, as soon as I looked at what the BTC crowd was saying, like, oh, we must restrict everything to one megabyte. I was like, well, what are you guys talking about? Like, that's, that's like the craziest thing in the world. Like one megabyte. I had one megabyte on a floppy disk 20 years ago at, at university. Right, you know, we already have, you know, I can go and buy a little rack unit this big that holds a petabyte. Um, and so storage is not the problem here. Like, that, and kind of that's when I s went to the Bitcoin Cash um, and big blocks and, and kind of just went, this is, this is how it has to go. Like if you want to build this system in such a way that it's actually going to make a material change to the lives of people around the world, It's got to be able to accommodate what they want to do. You can't, you can't change anything if only a few thousand kind of elite people are actually allowed to use the system. It just doesn't work. And so since that moment, I was like, well, 100% BSV. And I, I, I looked at other cryptos and I kind of just saw it, 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 it appeared to me like The BTC guys had, for a quite a long time, had had grabbed hold of that protocol, and really, and when I went back and looked at it, it, it was a process of okay, remove the most useful parts first. Okay, get rid of IP to IP, you know, get rid of um, get rid of uh, the open use of script, get rid of particular opcodes that do interesting things, and really start to lock down all of this functionality that that enables us to do. The cool stuff, um, which which we we can now do on BSV, and um, you know, I, I was just looking at it, going, "Wow, this is crazy." You know, it, it it looks to me like Satoshi Nakamoto figured out, you know, he created lightning in a bottle, and that was that was Bitcoin, 
and we've managed to t keep hold of that lightning in a bottle. And when I look out at crypto, I see a thousand guys selling jars that are empty and trying to say, no, it's the same as the bottled lightning. And it's just not, it's, it's, it's really, it's just mostly investment scams. And so I kind of, I don't even focus on that at all. Like I get people saying, oh, but what about this or that blockchain? I'm just like, man, I, I, I don't even know about it. Like, I don't even care. Like, as far as I'm concerned, this is it. This is, and now it's becoming quite clear that it does scale. Um, you know, just in the last four days, we've had multiple blocks larger than a gigabyte. So there was even like, a, 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 I think, two, two gigabyte blocks that have, have been mined. And this is how it's meant to go. And, you know, these blocks get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's an enterprise system or, or enterprise systems used by miners that have enterprise level storage and enterprise level handling of, of, of transactions and bandwidth and all of that sort of thing that enables this to be something that anyone, anyone anywhere in the world can pull out their device, send a Bitcoin transaction, and it's so cheap that they don't even need to think about the cost. Um, and that's what, that's what they don't have anywhere else in, in the kind of the crypto landscape is, you know, I even look at things like Dogecoin, you know, you've got, you got guys like Elon Musk who, you know, I thought the guy was smarter than that going out and saying, Oh, Dogecoin is, is the best coin for, for exchange. And I'm like, man, look at the fees on Dogecoin. It still costs like a dollar to send a transaction on Dogecoin because it doesn't scale. And, um, you know, they're saying, oh, well, we're going to go and scale Dogecoin. And I'm like, dude, it's already, the work's already being done. You know, we have, like, I look at, so it, it's actually the Bitcoin Association who, um, who owns the project, the Bitcoin SV node uh, software project. That is really a good first step. Uh, they're developing the successor to that, which is called TerraNode. So that's another project being run by the association. And that's essentially being done to support kind of those first steps for those enterprise nodes to, to be developed and, and created and operate in such a way that we can support, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of transactions a day. Um, but eventually, I, I, I think that that role will need to actually be taken on by the miners themselves. And, and they will actually go and build their own custom implementations and their own custom software. And because really what's important to understand and, and what I think really most of the people in, in the crypto landscape don't get at all is that the software that you use is not the protocol. A protocol is simply a way of defining a message. And you can use whatever software you like to build the message. And as long as everyone else can read the message and it means the same thing, it doesn't matter what software they're using. And so eventually the process, you know, like miners will come up with their own versions of particular parts of the software that maybe perform better or maybe allow them to um, <clears throat> offer cheaper, cheaper services to people who are using the network. Uh, and and that's, that's really when I think that that we've made it you know that's that's when once those guys are taking on that responsibility which currently is being done um altruistically by by the association um that's when we can sort of almost let go a little bit the reins and, and un, under the assumption that these guys now understand that the protocol is fixed and it's possible to build any software they like that but it's got to match the protocol. As long as their messages are formatted correctly, as long as everyone agrees, then, then we're okay. So Absolutely. Now, for our audience, the most well-known blockchains are Bitcoin, of course, Ethereum, the permission private protocols such as the Hyperledger ones. And we've had a few instances of BSV in the show. For those in the audience who don't grasp or have yet to know BSV, how can you like summarize what it is, how it came to be, and what are the say the top three strengths of BSV versus the 
Ethereum's, you know, of the world. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to what you first. So what what is BSV? Well, we say BSV is Bitcoin. So so if you go back to to the original block of the BSV blockchain, it is the Genesis block, which is the same Genesis block that that they um, have on on BTC, also on BCH, and you know all of the other silly Bitcoin, you know, forks hack versions that they've got out there, Bitcoin Gold and all of that. Um, what we really believe is that is that we are the original chain of Bitcoin. Um, what happened in between sort of 20, 2010 when Satoshi really kind of went quiet um, was that, you know, the protocol was actually, well, through the software, use of the protocol was really hampered. They put a lot of restrictions on top of what people could do. And that kind of, that's what precipitated that, that split for, for BTC and BCH. And, and from my perspective, BCH actually took Bitcoin. And what, what they have now on BTC is not Bitcoin at all. It doesn't do what it says in the white paper. They've actually made so many fundamental changes uh, to the way the system functions that I don't think you could call that Bitcoin anymore. I mean, just the fact that you can go and replace your transaction in the mempool by paying a slightly higher fee, well, that, that's a double spend. And they've now made that legitimate. And that's what the entire system was designed to prevent. Um, so, I mean, we believe that BSV is Bitcoin. Uh, since... You know, obviously we had the BCH, we had Bitcoin Cash for like a, a year, a little bit over a year, and we split again. Um, Bitcoin Cash have gone on their own journey. Um, I think they've had, you know, more more splits and splits and splits. Um, but in within BSV, I think what's been really great to see is that since 2018, where we had the, the split with BCH, there's been no further argument at all uh, about what we're doing at the protocol level. And that is essentially, and, and, and I think a lot of people don't understand this, all that we have done is we've, we've peeled off all of the limits. We've just said, okay, you wanna make a big transaction, make a big transaction. If you wanna use a, a different script, use a different script. Like in, in BTC, it's, it's highly restricted. You're only allowed to use a very particular number of quite, you know, low functionality scripts to 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 exchange funds. Whereas in BSV, it's effectively unlimited. So I can now create a a transaction that spends money into a script that maybe solves some kind of computational problem or um, is actually locked into its own function so that the person who hands it on can't spend it and make it look like something different or you know, whatever it needs to be. Um, and so the goal is to end in a, or, or, or it's, it's really the goal is never ending. It's always to grow and grow and grow and, and in, increase the capabilities. And so it's really the unbounded vision of Bitcoin. And so unbounded block size, unbounded transaction size, unbounded potential. And so within that, really the potential is to be able to do almost anything that you can imagine. And if, if you can think it up, it, it's really, it's possible to do it. And so what, what we've been doing um, uh, at my company ELAS is really exploring within that, like, like what is possible. And, um, you know, we have a heap of different um, token designs that allow us to do a heap of different things. And, you know, this is, I think, again, where, where we're sort of fundamentally different to a lot of those other blockchains, like, like where you see tokens being created on Ethereum. I think, you know, a lot of the time what happens is someone comes up with an idea for a project and they go, oh, I want to go, I want to build a thing that does this. And, and they make the mistake of thinking that the first thing is I make all of the tokens and then I sell those tokens. And then I go back and I build the functionality that allows the people to come in and then use the tokens to use the thing. And it, it's like, it's totally backwards. Well, A, you, you're creating an illegal security. 
And I think anyone who thinks that code is law and because they're doing it on Ethereum or, or wherever makes them somehow immune from securities law is, is really smoking from the wrong bucket. You know, you guys need to, to get what, get this picture in your head that, that the law does not care what your medium of scam is. They just care that it's a scam. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people out there who are creating these things that essentially are a scam and they themselves don't even realize that it's a scam. They think that by creating a token, selling it to people, taking the money and then trying to build a project around it is a legitimate form of business. And that even when they fail to build that thing and run out of money and go, oh, we're really sorry. And the token holders are kind of left with this no value thing, they think that's okay. And it, it really, it's not. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of people, I think, unfortunately, who, who wanted to do the right thing, but who will end up getting in a lot of trouble. The method in which, and I'm assuming you're speaking about the classic ICOs or ITOs or whatever the hell they're calling it these days, right? In 2017, there was this huge ICO movement globally uh, where probably 70% of or more of those projects were either just a white paper or a means to, you know, uh, separate people from their money, to, to put it lightly. It could be done in tokens. It could be done in any form of system or financial trustworthy system that is not bound to the technology. So my question to you in terms of the technologies, how does BSV prevent such a bubble, I want to say, from happening, given that it's also a programmable type of blockchain? Well, sadly, um, the truth is that it doesn't. And we've already seen the emergence of, of this type of thing um, on BSV, not at the same kind of level. Like, I mean, we haven't seen any kind of $100 million uh, token sales happening, but um, you know, I think I think definitely when people see it happening in BSV, there's much more of a, of an effort to kind of reach out to the people who are trying to do this and and to really to really help them or try to help them to understand that what why what they're doing is illegal. And I've literally had this conversation with a few people who are like, oh, but you know, there's nothing wrong with what we're doing and and you have to actually point it out to them step by step that look, when you do this and you sell that to somebody and you take their money and you spend that money and that person, what you've actually given that person ha has no value, um, you know, that that is fraud and that's illegal. Like then they kind of get it. So there's a community component there and that I like because I truly believe that blockchain both in principle and technically is a big collaboration enabler. And when we have the ICO craze of 17, that means there there's a bunch of people involved that are enabling that type of behavior. And when you say this, and, and, and I love your response is that, well, there's been cases, but the community has moved towards preventing those cases from flourishing because that's not the purpose of how this community is building the technology to begin with. The difference I see is that the real way to do a, a project using this technology is, is not issue the token first and sell it. It's, it's, it's create a business, you know, create a company, make yourself a director of that company, take responsibility for what you're doing. Find an investor, find somebody who believes in what you're doing enough to pay you to go and build it and have equity. And it's only once the application is built, like, like the thing about tokens is tokens are worthless. To a token in itself is nothing unless it's tied to some kind of real world right to a good or a service. And, uh, and once you've built the project, you can make the tokens on demand. Like you don't need to create your 50,000 tokens up front and sell them for $10 each and then somehow build your application to then use those 50,000 tokens. Create a company, sell 50,000 shares, 
give the shareholders equity in your platform. And then when the platform is ready, create whatever type of token it is that you need um, and, and, and design it in such a way that it functions in the way that you need it to work. And so this is, this is where we come back to what, what's been enabled with BSV by taking away all of the limits on scripting and transaction size and, and all of this sort of thing. It means that you can create a, a token that has almost any kind of functionality that you want. So you can create a token where I give it, you know, so like a loyalty point. I go, I come into the shop, I buy a coffee, you go, here's a loyalty point. The next time I come into the shop, I go, oh, hey, here's my 10 loyalty points and poof, they evaporate. And, but I get a free coffee. And so the, they represent a right to a real world good or service. Now I, as the coffee vendor, I don't want a system where I've got to create 50,000 coffee loyalty tokens and, and sort of hand them out one by one. And then when I run out, I've got to do some kind of new ICO. It's whenever somebody comes in and buys a coffee, I, I create a token and I give it to them. And then when they bring 10 of them back, I give them a free coffee. And those tokens are consumed in that process. And you know, so the, the whole idea is that the the token is matched to design it, it to the design of the the user experience. And so that might mean that the token only exists to be used once and it's consumed, or that the token exists to be handed around. Maybe the token has particular properties within a game or or it you know it represents like a kilowatt hour of energy or a ton of carbon or you know any kind of thing. I, I think one of the biggest problems that we've had as a company um, at, at ELAS is that that our solution is is so so general purpose. You know, we the way that we create the token, so we can create a token to do just about anything you like. You know, I can create a ballot paper token that will only be spendable if you submit a, a correct, like a valid vote response. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a million ideas. And, but the problem is when I look at those million ideas, it's like I'm staring into the blue sky and I can't, I can't see which way to go. And, and so we've really um, actually struggled to, to find a way forward. It, it's given us a lot of time to focus on the core uh, of, of our technology and to really make that very polished and, and easy to use. Um, uh, but the next step for us is really to find the customers who want to exploit these, these superpowers. So, I mean, just to give you an idea, like I keep telling people, like we can, so for example, I can ask a million separate people a question, the same question, uh, and get a million individualized responses from those million people in one hour for $100. And I think people don't realize just how cheap BSV is. I don't think people realize just how cheap, just how fast, just how capable the network is. But that's literally like, so when you scale that, you know, to like, hey, let's ask a nation who we want as our leader, we can totally do that on BSV right now. Um, and, and the thing is, it's not even hard. And the other thing is, we don't need to reinvent the legal process and the administrative process that you already have, like where you have a system where you must present yourself to a polling place and have somebody sign off that you came and you voted. Well, we can make that system. We can make uh, uh, where there's a token that represents you. And when you show up at the polling booth, that person can easily find your token and, and say, yes, I validate that this person did show up and I did hand them a randomly selected ballot paper. That person takes that ballot paper, they can make their vote, that ballot, the vote is recorded against it, but there's, we can dissociate by inserting a person into the process. We can dissociate the link between the voter and their vote. And that's, that's really achieved by using the existing administrative process that you've been using for the last 200 years. You know, we don't, we don't need to change. I think a lot of people, you know, I see a lot of arguments out there that, oh, you know, the regulatory landscape really needs to be rewritten to accommodate, to accommodate us. And I see this is like, these are just needy children saying, 
these I don't like that I have to go to bed at eight o'clock at night. I must be allowed to stay up until midnight. And I, to me, the regulators should be turning around and saying, no, these are the regulations. You conform to them. And to me, that's no problem because when you have a system with unbounded flexibility and the and are able to look at a set of regulations and a, and a process and implement a system that that works perfectly within that, um, there's really no need for the legislature to enact any change for your system to be legal, used, um, and successful. That is most interesting because right now in here in Brazil we're going through a huge or we've gone through a huge debate about the elections but I'm I'm I'm, I'm not going to go into that that's 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 done so but one thing that's uh, at least curious to me is that you're the second person I bring to the show which is a proponent and an active developer on BSV James was the other one who I brought is also a big proponent and is working on BSV. You're both Australian. What's the context of having these many BSV people in Australia? And why hasn't BSV been as powerful as you're describing something that has been adopted all over the world? Because it, it really sounds to me that this is everything that we're hearing about Ethereum 2.0, um, taproot on, on Bitcoin and what have you from many others is already being resolved very elegantly in BSV from everything I'm hearing from the stuff that I've read. What's the game with BSV in Australia and why hasn't this picked up around the world yet? Yeah, it, it's very interesting that, that um, there is uh, so much of uh, like, like, visibility of bitcoin uh, in australia and you know obviously we we support the idea that craig wright is satoshi um you know i i know craig i've met craig on many occasions um i, I speak to him not, not like vocally but I, I, through direct message and and messaging in a forum almost on a weekly basis and he's never said anything that would make me believe that he's not Satoshi like the guy so I mean part of my work so I, 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 I have Elas I also work for the Bitcoin Association where I develop uh, educational uh, content for them and so the first uh, course that we released actually the introduction to Bitcoin theory what we actually did is we we took the Bitcoin white paper and we broke it down line by line and, and we went through and we literally, we took every single line of the white paper and we expanded on it and, and really tried to give people that much deeper level of context around what was being said. Because, you know, that, that document, it, it's, it's very short. You know, it's really, it's only seven, seven or eight pages long. And in, in just one sentence, you, you know, you, there's there's reams of information that that's just been condensed down into into that and and really when I struggled when I was having trouble kind of putting words around it or or even it, in my own understanding he's my source that's where I go you know when I when I want to understand better I go to Craig and I think people go oh I think, you know you get nothing back but techno babble and and I've been in the situation where Craig has I've listened to Craig saying explaining something and and I've come away from it and gone literally nothing that he just said makes any sense at all whatsoever and gone away six months later come back learnt learnt a bunch of new stuff watched the same thing again and just gone oh my god I I totally now I completely understand exactly what he's referring to here. And I've, I've got the context now to put around that. And, you know, he's so, he's very busy. He, he, he's very economical with his words. And so, so sometimes you, you have to do a, a lot of legwork to really figure out what he's saying, but almost always, or, or really, you know, that, it's it's very sensible um it really 
meshes with the whole idea of what Bitcoin is, which is a, a, a legally compliant system that scales massively and which is secured uh, both by uh, techniques um, that come from cryptography, such as hash functions and elliptic curve digital signatures, but mostly and most importantly, and, and this is what all of these other blockchains, so this is where they fail. This is where they've got the jar, they've got the cryptography, but there's no lightning. They don't have the economics right. And what Bitcoin really nailed and, and I mean, from the beginning, in 2009, when he made the first block, he nailed the economics. And the economics is such that, and this is the, the, the focus of the second course that um, we're really in the final stages of putting together. It should come out probably, I think, in maybe one or two months. You know, these courses, they take ages to develop. But it's called Introduction to Bitcoin Infrastructure. And really what it does is it focuses on um, I think it's section five of the white paper that describes the network and what are the instructions um, that a node must do to participate in the validation of transactions and the building of blocks on the network. And really looking at what are the economic incentives that encourage them to, to join the system so you've got to remember there's, there's no leader. There's no leader in the system. There's no person saying, you do this, you do that, you come in here. It's really, it's just the system. And I've got some money and actually I've got some technology. I believe that I can do a better job than those guys. I'm going to invest that money in a node and I'm going to start participating in that block building process. And the incentives are such that uh, there is a lot of money to be made if you are successful and can scale the network and scale your systems in an efficient manner, and this means getting access to cheap energy, it means getting access to low cost storage, um, high capacity computing systems, you need really good bandwidth, like all of these things. And as well as that, uh, the miners really have some responsibility in making sure that there's enough users coming into the systems, uh, into the system and, and actually doing transactions and, and, and putting information into the network and paying them to, to do the time stamping function. Because really, when, if you read the white paper, all that a block is, is someone taking a big bunch of transactions and going timestamp. At, at this time, all of these existed. That's, and that is literally all they're doing. They do that approximately once every 10 minutes. Um, and, and so it's, it's about encouraging them to come and join that system. And then it's even, it, it gets even more interesting at the core of that network, those enterprises who are participating in that system of, of building those blocks, the incentive is for them to be completely 100% open and honest with each other. It's almost like they want to be, sharing with everyone, hey guys, I, I've got these transactions. I'm gonna put them in a block in this order and I'm working on the proof of work. And if I find it, like, like this will be my block. And, and all of those nodes are working together and they're all sharing that information very openly with each other. So if one, you know, you get all these ideas about, oh, well, a node can hoard transactions. Well, it's actually a terrible idea because if I hoard a million transactions, and then I find a valid proof of work, I've actually got to propagate all of those millions of transactions out to everybody else before they can accept my block. And somebody else who's already gone, hey guys, this is what I'm working on. And oh, look, I found a valid proof of work. Everyone else has already seen all of this. They can validate that in 100 milliseconds. Whereas the guy who withheld a million transactions, he's got a lot of work ahead of him to actually push all of that information out to the network. So at the core of the system, you see that there is this extreme incentive to be very open and very honest. And I don't know if you're familiar with um, the card game 500, but there's this idea that you, you can play a hand as an open misere. And it means that you put all of your cards on the table and you say, I, I'm 100% certain that I, I literally can't win here. 
and I'm going to let you all see my cards and you've got to play against me to lose. And, and it's kind of that idea of being so open about what you're doing that you're literally showing people inside your node what's happening um, that, that really kind of blows my mind. And so having a, a, a global system for managing money and, and it, it's really, it's an infrastructure platform uh, for, for money, for shares, for, for you know, whatever land rights, uh, property, anything that you can think of, we can manage it with this, with this system. Having that system designed in such a way that it's purely honest in the center really has the chance to change how we interact with each other as humans. Because at the moment, I look at the global systems that we have in place, the money systems, all of this kind of thing, and, and, and it's the level of naked dishonesty that, that really makes me sick. And, you know, I see that with this system, if we place honesty in the middle and we disincentivize bringing dishonesty into the system by basically making it totally open, um, we just might have a chance to really change society. And it's kind of this is one of this is one of those times, you know, it that that happens where where you know you get like a like a like a revolution that that can happen very quickly. You know, this will be you know this is like going from um the horse and cart to like the space rocket, but in about 10 years, you know, like literally. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, you go back to the internet, you know, really they started the internet started early 90s to to kind of or even late 80s. I think my first first time I ever connected to a bulletin board would have been maybe 1991 or something like that. Um, and it was really not until maybe 2003, 2005. So, you know, you had a good 15, 20 years there. That was infrastructure building. So it every house had to be connected to the internet. You had to, you know, you literally had to build and sell 100 million computers to 100 million people with 100 million modems to connect to 100 million phone lines so that they could connect to the internet. Well, the difference today is all of that infrastructure is already in place. And all we have to do is provide the actual software that people are going to use within that system. So it, it, it really, I, I don't think people are anticipating how fast it will happen when it happens. And it hasn't started, it, I don't think it's really started to happen yet. I think blockchain is, is a bit of a MacGuffin like it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a scam where like people are go oh we can solve everything with blockchain and really they're selling empty jars like the it's 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 not really solving the problems in a way that that promotes the the honesty and the openness which is what we need and it won't be until we've sort of there's a few things that still have to be re-enabled within the protocol and they've taken a long time because they're, they're quite complex. And um, when those come, it will mean that BSV, we can take existing blockchains and, and simply tack them onto the side of Bitcoin as a side chain. And we can actually use the proof of work of Bitcoin to secure the information that's being processed in those other blockchains. So they won't all go away but they will all sort of become part of this one singular system, if you like. Absolutely. No, I love the vision, really. It echoes some of the conversations I've had with other guests where the broad consensus is that there will be convergence. Most of the people think that Ethereum will be one of the remaining major public blockchains, uh, Bitcoin the other, uh, but all the other uh, altcoin-based blockchains will kind of lose purpose once uh, things start settling down and massive adoption, as you, as you mentioned, um, starts taking place based on 
valuable use cases, which is the whole purpose of this thing. And, and this is something that I, in the regular show we do, is the weekly basis is the three top use cases, in my opinion, that are the highlight of the usage of blockchain in general. So that's that's where I focus the most. So in, in that regard, and with Dallas, what are, I don't want to go into like huge rabbit holes, but what are, let's say, the top three or the top five use cases you've seen emerge in your work with BSV that you can say, well, this use case has drastically improved whatever came before it, or even this use case wouldn't exist if it wasn't for blockchain or for, or if it wasn't for BSV. What do you have that, of course, you can share? I don't want to go into anything you can't. But. Look, that, that's a really great question. Um, I I actually believe that that there, there hasn't been a whole lot of things that have emerged on BSV that I look at and, and go, Wow, that's actually really changing. That's really changing the game. You know, I've seen, you know, there are there are there are things out there like like games and and social media platforms, and they offer a point of difference over what's out there in that there is an aspect of value exchange and data sovereignty. Like, oh, you you own your own kind of social media. Um, look, I. At the moment, I have yet really to see, you know, what I'm really waiting to see is where somebody comes in and and really fixes something in such a way that it's just so elegant and so so clever and, and so uh, radically more efficient than what's done today that really that anybody would look at it and go 100% that's that's the way we're doing it, and and I haven't really seen that yet. Um, even within it, you know, like I believe for for us um, that our path forward is is really in in government and enterprise and and helping them to build sort of back end systems. You know, I don't really see us being the ones who build the applications that directly go out and get used by by customers. Um, uh, that said, we do have um, we are about to release uh, some products that we've developed, uh, which are pretty cool. So we have like um, a, a multi-signature wallet, so where we can create uh, bank, effectively Bitcoin bank accounts, where uh, up to ten people can control funds, and you know we can do that in a way where it's you know you you need uh, two of ten signatures, or eight of ten, or ten of ten signatures, or or even three of five, or whatever it is that you need. And it's all very elegantly handled and each user, like it's very point and click and, and you know, really something that that I, I, I would expect that my mother would be able to use. And, you know, she's kind of a little bit my test market. You know, I, I, want, I, want, I want to design things that my mom would be able, I would be able to, to load the website up in her browser and go, okay, mom, go and do a transaction. And, and really for her to be able to do that uh, very, very simply and easily, and I believe that's what we've been able to achieve. But it, it's really just uh, a tech demo of our platform, and it's it's very token ready. But what we need is somebody who has a use case for tokens, where we, we can really create those tokens and embed the functionality that they need into them. And then use this wallet as the means to to interact with them. And so it's very it's built to be fully customizable. Um, you know, you can really change the user experience quite radically um, with minimal, um, um, I guess, development time frame and overhead. Um, yeah, I mean, I th the where, where I really see this going is you know within a country right every country every sovereign nation has a document or a set of documents that define who they are what 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 makes that country that country and you know you go to the united states they have you know they have the bill of rights they have the constitution they have all of these 
fantastic documents that really say, we're America. This is why we're declaring sovereignty. This is, and this is how we're going to run our nation. And over time, those documents, they do get updated. You know, you get constitutional amendments coming through. One of the things that I see is that this system will actually be used to record those documents. So because now instead of the constitution being some moldy piece of parchment that sits on a wall in the Smithsonian and, and really nobody can ever get within 10 feet of it, well, now it actually becomes something that everybody can go and look directly at the record of the constitution on the blockchain. They can see that it was signed into existence you know, by the government. And when the amendments take place, they can actually see that the vote for those amendments, they can see who signed yay, who signed nay. They can see um, all of that information. And in fact, we can program that document such that, uh, or the token that holds that document, I should say, such that for it to be amended, it can only be done when you have that kind of correct level of agreement between all of the parties. And so I really see this being a way of, of managing uh, that core documentation that outlines government and the function of sovereignty in a nation. And, and that goes right down to like, you know, how do we decide who's in charge? How do we decide, how do we decide on what decisions to make? And, you know, the system is really capable um, in that way. And all we really need is, is somebody to come in and, and inject the funds and project the will to explore this on us for, for it to be, be able to be done. And at the moment, we, I guess we haven't seen, you know, we've, we've had some interest from a couple of countries in, in South America, uh, not specifically Brazil. Uh, at this stage, but um, you know, there's definitely countries who are looking at this and starting to grasp that if if you are in a rapidly changing governmental situation and you need a stable way of recording your intent and even uh, outlining that intent and asking 50 million people, do you agree with this? Is this how you want to be governed? This is a system that can do that for you and do it in a way that's fast, low cost, honest and open. And, um, you know, that's, that's really, to me, that's, that's, the, that's the A-line use case. Because once you've been able to do that, everything else is just gravy. It sort of strikes me as something that can then evolve to something relatable or connected to a DAO, right, the DAOs. Uh, then it could expand to even having those rules that have been recorded uh, to sort of retrofit into other industries, uh, automated rules, where now once you have the regulation written somewhere within blockchain, you can bring it into, say, a smart contract or an application because that's already embedded into how that uh, application runs because it's immersed in that uh in that digital sort of framework that carries on the rules and the regulations uh, to which uh, the the contracts and the processes need to abide to. So it, it's it's really and and I like the way you're positioning BSV as this sort of civil infrastructure because I, I have a hard time with the overall blockchain hype. I think the hype is, is great for conversation, but it sort of detracts from the actual use of the technology, which is an infrastructure technology. And I'm a big proponent that you have to treat things for what they are. And blockchain is an infrastructure technology. So, I, I you know, it's a huge debate. Um, but I think as far as I've read and the way you're positioning BSV, it sort of speaks directly to that. And if either countries or companies are interested in using blockchain for what it is, it sounds that because of the capabilities that BSV brings to the table, it sounds a an interesting, somewhat cheap way to start, you know, diving into what 
blockchains in general could do for them, right? Well, I, I wouldn't even say block blockchains in general. I would just say say Bitcoin uh, because I I look at what other blockchains say they can do, and quite often they can't do even a small part of it. And uh, you, you know, one of the big problems I see is that pe people love to attack proof of work um, and say, oh, look, proof of stake is is way better. And, and I mean, this it's really easy to like, I mean, you just look at the incentives, right? So, so when I say Bitcoin's security is economic, it's all about the incentive of proof of work. Proof of work is there to ensure that when that enterprise makes that decision to enter that block building arena, they're spending money. They're actually building capable systems. Um, and, you know, because the idea is that they've got to be able to, to trans gather off, off the internet and rebroadcast in, in a lot of cases, uh, collate, validate, and then put into a block every single financial action taking place in the world in real time. And, and that's their job. Um, and with proof of work, because the payment is directly for the work they did and has nothing to do with how much money they have in the bank or anything like that, like you might be, you might be working with a shoestring budget, but you might have found a way to do something in a way that is so much more efficient than everybody else that you can outcompete them on a shoestring budget and become, you know, like a powerhouse. Whereas when you look at proof of stake, you know, if you, you, you know, I, I, in, blockchain must be infrastructure. If it's not infrastructure and if you're not scaling it for widespread use, what are you doing? You're just wasting time. You're wasting time. You're wasting money. And when I look at proof of stake, the entire idea uh, of infrastructure is lost in that system because there is zero incentive to spend any of your money on infrastructure. In fact, the entire incentive is for you to take every cent that you have and turn it into whatever the coin is and put it in your staking wallet. And then for your validator to run on the crappiest, most cheapest computer that you can buy because you don't want to spend a single penny on infrastructure. Oh, I don't want to pay for bandwidth because I've got to pull money out of my staking wallet. I don't want to pay for a bigger computer because I've got to pull money out of my staking wallet. And so you end up with this entire system where the whole thing is built on this crappy stuff and, and, and it just can't support uh, a global user base. And so I look at proof of stake and people go, oh, well, proof that proof of work is, is better. I'm like, well, the answer is it's not that proof of work is, is better. It's that proof of stake doesn't work. Like it literally, it can't scale. And whereas proof of work, like the whole idea is that you invest money into the system. You're, you're taking your money and you're using it to make the system better by making your own system better. And as, as you have these miners who are all improving over the top of each other. This is where we get into, um, and I've been reading a lot, lot about um, like th this guy, Stackelberg. Uh, he, he, he really uh, outlined how this kind of system um, can be explained uh, economically. And it's that there's always someone who's at the front of the pack, but that person can never stay there forever. And, and, and this is what you have in the mining game. You've, got, you've always got someone who's the best miner but then you have a young up and comer. Maybe they don't have the dead wood that this guy has. They can move fast, break things, but then end up with a system that's more capable and better. And they can win more of that um, reward for themselves and use that. But the whole idea is that they must build infrastructure. If they don't have the right infrastructure, they can't adequately participate. So the only reason they get more of a reward is that their infrastructure is performing better than the other guys. And so to me, you know, that just throws all of the arguments about proof of anything else, proof of I've seen proof of authority, proof of proof of stake, proof of like half a dozen other different things. They're all just they're all just fake kind of consensus mechanisms that actually centralize all of the decision making in one tiny group, whereas proof of work says, hey, you know, the, the whole idea of Bitcoin is the protocol never changes. The protocol is set in stone, is fixed. The only thing we argue about is who's who's faster, who's better at building blocks. And, and you know, that's where we're at at the moment. And, and we're seeing that scaling very rapidly. We're seeing the capacity of the system to handle massive transaction loads 
are really increasing very rapidly. I mean, we're still nowhere near, you know, to be clear, we can't do the US dollar on Bitcoin SV today. No way. Like, I mean, the country that we, we, we are working with at the moment is Tuvalu. And they're literally one of the smallest countries in the world. You know, they have 11,000 people there. Um, we can do their cash system. We can manage that level of transactions. We could probably manage, you know, a million people using cash a day at the moment. But I mean, that just shows you that we have to scale. And, you know, we're, we're a thousand times bigger than BTC already. So we're doing gigabyte blocks or two gigabyte blocks, actually. So we're a thousand times bigger than BTC. But we have to go another thousand times bigger than that at least before we could even consider offering to do something like a, a US dollar uh, on, on the blockchain. And it'll get there, right? It, the, way, the way this is supposed to work and the way the incentives make you work in the network is, 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 is getting there, is made to get there. If you look at, if you look at exponential growth, um, the fact that we've gone from one megabyte to one gigabyte uh, in what is it now, like three, four years? It tells me that we have less than four years to go from one gigabyte to one terabyte. And once we get to one terabyte, then we're in a situation where we, we're handling, you know, tens of millions of transactions per second. Um, that's a situation where you can make some serious change in the world. And I, I believe wholeheartedly that actually because of how much work's already been done in, in pulling, pulling it back to the bare protocol and really getting it down to that bare metal Bitcoin, none of the stupid rules that, that the core developers spent so much time thinking of these elaborate software rules. And I mean, you could go dig around in the BTC source code. Some of the shit that's in there is just insane at how complicated and, and what they're trying to stop you from doing. You know, they're literally stopping you from trying to do anything outside of exchanging large amounts of money. That's the only thing they want you to be able to do with the system. And to me, that's like, that's probably the least useful thing about it. And I look at it and go, it's, you guys, you know, you've really just shot yourselves in the face with this. Like you, you, you're not going anywhere. It's, it's, it's sort of working to prevent the system from working. A hundred percent because, and, and, you know, it's really, it's, it, uh, you know, I don't want to go into the the whole like, oh, it's it's controlled by company X and shell company of company Y or whatever. Like, it, it they're trying to sell their own crappy bolt-on systems, these side chains and Liquid and and Lightning Network, and that really don't function properly and and don't uh, aren't if you know effectively once you move your money into a Lightning channel, you're not using Bitcoin anymore. You've you've you're off the Bitcoin network now. You're in the Lightning network, and that's a whole different bag of hurt. Like that Lightning network, the way they've designed that is, well, I can't I can't see in a million years how that can succeed at scale. Well, we'll get there. We're kind of past of our hour. I don't want to hold you longer. And and I think and if I could, I could just spend my whole night talking about this because it's so interesting. But uh, I'll be more than glad to host you on a you know future show with future developments. And I thank you so much for joining. Is there any parting words, uh, Brandon, that you wanna you know t you know leave for the audience? Because I I'm pretty sure that we'll sort of start to publicize BSV further in Brazil, so it can become this piece of interest that people can also look into and say, well, there's opportunities there for me too, because you know we're we're kind of always looking for opportunity. Sure. Uh, look, I would guess that my parting um, uh, word or, or advice would be that, look, I, I'm not here to sell anybody on BSV as some kind of an investment, right? Like people come to me all the time and they say, should I buy BSV? I say no. Like, and, and you know, 99% of the time, I'm glad that I said no, because the price since that person asked me, should I buy Bitcoin? The price has gone down. And I, I'm 100% here. I'm telling you, look, don't think of this as something that that you buy and you hold, and then one day you can sell for more money. Start to try and understand it as a platform that you can use to actually implement uh, business systems, business processes, and doing things in ways that uh, will allow you to outcompete other people. And and there are literally, you know, there's a thousand. You know, you look at big tech. 
there's a thousand things that big tech do today that are done really inefficiently. We can make those things a hundred times more efficient on Bitcoin. So uh, explore the capabilities. Um, oh, look, I'm going to shill my course. Uh, go to uh, www.bitcoinsv.academy. So that's the Bitcoin SV Academy website. Uh, the, the course that I wrote, um, is introduction to Bitcoin theory. So that's the breakdown of the Bitcoin white paper. I think anybody who wants to develop on Bitcoin really needs to understand the white paper and, and what it says and, and the system that it defines and how it works. And when it comes out, probably in about two months time, introduction to Bitcoin infrastructure, I think is really going to really cement for a lot of people that this is an infrastructure project. And it's, it's, it's not my responsibility to run a node I don't need to be validating my own transactions. I can simply use the network as a user, even though I'm using it on behalf of a million other users, I'm still just a user. I don't need to be a node. I don't need to be part of that infrastructure. I need to leverage the superpowers that that infrastructure is giving me. Because when you use Bitcoin, you get all of the superpowers that Bitcoin has. And so learn about those superpowers Think about what it is that you're trying to do. Think about the thing that you see in the world that's broken and think about how those superpowers can be applied to solve that problem. And that, that is how you make money with Bitcoin. It's not about buying and selling on, a, on an exchange or something like that. It's about building the future. Build the future. I think that's, that's the message. I'm going to tag this on the, on the headline. Awesome. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us. This was a, you know, quite a masterclass. Um, I'm happy to learn more about Bitcoin SV. Uh, hopefully the audience will also pick up on that and also learn a lot. Go after, you know, education, as we were discussing prior to start recording. Education is key for any advancement. And I'm, I'm glad that this is out in the open. So thanks for your work, uh, Brandon. We'll keep in touch. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, Mauricio. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you. Block Drops podcast is available on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts, and most of the major podcast platforms. You can contact us by email on blockdropspodcast at gmail.com, on Instagram at blockdropspodcast, and on Twitter at blockdropspod. O salve vai para o Brandon, que se acertou lá na madrugada da Austrália para falar com a gente aqui no Blog Talks. A gente fica por aqui. Até a próxima. Tchau.